thanks for the invitation. I appreciate it. I always like talking to groups like this. Um, as uh, my introduction mentioned, I am currently employed at Mississippi State University, but I graduated from the other MSU, Michigan State University. And I think um, that background has kind of led me down the path where I'm at and with some of the things I'm going to talk about today. Because in Michigan, I kind of cut my teeth in forestry managing northern harvests. High species diversity stands where we're managing for multiple merchantable species. So I moved down south and the game was we're managing lava. Okay, I can handle that. Um, but as a, some of the topics I'll talk about today, and in particular parts of Mississippi, and I imagine it's going to be true in Alabama as well, the model of pine production silviculture is coming under stress. There's lots of factors that are really kind of um, weighing on the traditional way of going about doing things. And so as foresters, we've got to think about how we're going to do things differently to meet the current market conditions and some of the market conditions we anticipate going forward. And that's where really some of this mixed species stand silviculture come, has come about. Um, I'll just give you this one um, caveat. This is not for everyone, okay? And I'll try to identify some areas or some traits that where this may uh, be beneficial to you as a forest landowner or not. Uh, before I get started, I need to identify my collaborators. Uh, and I'll try to stay tethered to this one. Um, work with several people from around the South. Mike Blazier at LSU, Sean Tanger at LSU, my current colleagues at Mississippi State, Brady Self, Jason Gordon, Josh Granger, uh, Auburn University, Bo Broadbeck, I believe was here yesterday talking to you folks, and uh, David Buckley out of the University of Tennessee. So this is a truly collaborative talk that's going to bring in silviculture, economics, and some social factors. So all these, these uh, parties contributed. All right. I want to take. Uh, I wanted to start out by actually stepping back in time. All right, this is a pretty ugly scene, a moonscape more or less. That was a pretty typical scene around the southeastern United States around 1920, 1930. All right, this is kind of the aftermath of the cut out and get out era that we underwent. All right, and you can see. Really, this is a map of the percent volume that was taken out, or percent volume that was supplied for the country by region. And you can kind of see by year that we, where I'm from, up in the Lake States, we had really exhausted our timber supplies about the turn of the century. We kind of uh, hit peak volume removal. And where they came was the southeastern United States. Okay, and so we ended up with a landscape that unfortunately we weren't practicing forestry at all. We were just doing exploitative harvesting. So we ended up with a pretty uh, bad situation for forest landscapes. Fast forward to around 1950. All right, this is going to be a more likely scene that you would have seen out there. Okay? There were several reasons for this. Probably the primarily biological reason was erosion to stabilize the soil from all that topsoil loss that had occurred in the southeast. But there was another reason, okay, that kind of motivated folks for putting trees in the landscape. What was it? What economic reason really drove us to put trees back out there? I can hear, but not all at once. <laughs> People did things like reading newspapers. It's, like, it's a foreign art these days. Um, but there was a huge demand for pulp, and the southeast had lots of available land in this tremendous climate in which we could grow trees. All right, so pulp really drove a lot of reforestation back on the landscape. And so we arrived kind of around in the 1970s when we really got kicking in terms of doing production forestry, and that is the typical model that a lot of you are probably familiar with today. Planting stands at over 600 trees per acre, um, doing multiple thinnings. At first, obviously, uh, for pulp, and then you're getting progressively higher and higher in your product classes that you're selling. As we advanced, we got into herbaceous weed control, which really improved our productivity, and fertilization on some sites. Phosphorus, in particular, was important for increasing productivity. And what that did is it built the wood basket of the world. The southeast is the wood basket of the world. We have more plantations and managed forests than anywhere else. And just take a look at this graph in terms of 
the amount of area in plantations from the 1950s going all the way up to about the year 2000. And look at the volume you produce. But what I'm really proud of as a forester, because this is a success story for foresters, is look at our pulpwood rotation age, how it's declined to below 20 years since we really started doing this. We've gotten much, much better at this. And that's truly a tribute to the, the foresters and forest researchers of the past. All right, so life was good. We had vibrant markets and we had lots of wood out there to produce. Um, unfortunately, uh, things change and we begin to, or we began in the 1970s, actually about the time when we really started producing uh, the, the production at high rates in our plantations, we began to hit a snag in the model. Okay, what you're looking at here, these are pulp mills in the United, in the southeastern United States in the, in the pulping capacity in terms of tons uh, per day. And you can see we've reached peak pulp mill uh, capacity in about 1976. Does anybody know the last time we built a pulp mill in the southeastern United States? Early to mid-80s. Now there is one potentially going in Alabama, or excuse me, Arkansas, uh, in the future, but we really haven't been building pulp mills, okay? So the capacity of pulp mills has declined, and if you talk to any economists, I haven't heard one say, I expect pulp to leap back in the near future, okay? So that is straight the model. We don't have as many places to take the wood, and what's illustrating this is the map of Mississippi right now, these are our pulp mill locations in which we can rely on to draw from, all right? Take a look at the regions. In the northwest, you've got vast expanses where there's nowhere to take pulp, okay? So there, there's, there's been trouble. There's a bump in the road in our production model, all right? That bump has been magnified by a loss of loggers. We've lost, in Mississippi, between 30 and 40% of our logging workforce, really after the Great Recession uh, in the early to mid-2000s, and most recently from the gas, uh, oil and gas industry has been taking a lot of loggers off the landscape. Uh, there's also issues with getting um, logging equipment and insurance. So our logging capacity has gone down. So not only do we have fewer mills to take it, we've got fewer people to get the wood to the mill. So this whole model of supply chain is really coming under stress, at least in Mississippi, okay? And what that's done is that's put tremendous pressure on our prices. This is a timber price report Mississippi State puts out. I believe this is from 2018. Um, we break it up by regions of the state, and I, and I point it out in the Northwest because it's the worst. Just look, once again, to take a look at the pulp locations, just not much there. Uh, and take a look at the average Pine saw timber price in the Northwest, uh, $26 below it was 10, okay? We're getting far better in the Southwest, $42 per ton. So there are areas where it's getting darn hard to practice production forestry in Mississippi right now, okay? So in summary, what we have is we've got more wood than what we've ever had before. We've got less mills to take that wood to. We've got less loggers to transport that wood to the mill. And what that's ultimately doing, at least this is our observation in our extension group, is it's driving a lot of the small landowners out. Because loggers aren't willing to take a tract of land unless it's about 40 to 50 acres or it has high quality wood, okay? Basically, they lose too much money moving their equipment, so they're not going to take some of the smaller tracts. And that's problematic for forestry. It's for years and years, landowners had that market to rely upon that we see shrinking right now. And so we've come to the conclusion that we've really got to rethink some things going forward and how we manage our, our properties. In particular, for some of these small landowners uh, who don't have access to pulp mills. So in our minds, there's really two paths to go down for that particular type of landowner who finds himself in that situation. One, and I'm not going to talk too much about this today, um, is we rethink pine management. Pine management 2.0, you could probably put 12.0 uh, with all the different variations we've done. 
But in this, in this kind of model, what we're going to is genetically superior seedlings, MCP, planting at very low densities, 400 seedlings per acre, are potentially even a little less if you're investing in the genetics. Okay? We, and the plan is to go to two things. The first thing, you're cutting out chip and saw material that's bypassing the pulp bottleneck that we currently have. And the second thinning, you're taking out saw timber plus material, okay? So that's one way you can bypass the bottleneck for pulp. All right, but my contention for that, and I'm, I'm perfectly okay with, with practicing this type of forestry on the right site, where we can really maximize productivity, but we're growing into a market that's currently flooded. So yes, we're growing saw timber faster, but the prices aren't necessarily going to get better because we have such an overabundance of wood on the market. So my, my argument is, what's the hurry? So the second option to go after is kind of a mixed species stand management approach, okay? This approach is gonna utilize higher genetic diversity on the landscape as we're not using the MCP seedlings, higher species diversity, uh, and I think it works really well for multiple ownership objectives, okay? We're not maximizing anything. We're kind of being good at a lot of things. So if you have multiple ownership objectives for your property, like hunting, um, recreational use, and timber production, this might be a, a viable option for you. So we'll get into that a little bit. All right, just a little bit biologically about a mixed species stand, okay? They occur naturally in the southeast. You can see this is, uh oh Malware wasn't in my uh, presentation. <laughs> Back on the right track. <laughs> All right, so mixed species stands, what you're looking at is just your classic model for succession in the southeast from the old field going all the way up to kind of a climax oak hickory uh, forest, okay? So you can get a mixed stand where you have, uh, by the way, the definition I'm using of a mixed stand is it contains a pine and hardwood component. I'm not going to define the hardwood component because I think you as a landowner define the hardwood component because it, it's all based on what objectives you're trying to accomplish. Okay, but you can, you can get these naturally on the forest and landscape, and you can see mixed stands pretty regularly, regularly on the landscape. But the thing about a mixed stand I want to point out is that even though they can occur naturally, you typically don't maintain it as the hardwoods are going to, as forest succession continues, hardwoods are going to become more and more dominant over time. Okay, so it's kind of this transient stage between early successional and late successional forests. Okay? And in, when we practice pine forestry, we truncate it. We don't even get there because what do we do? We wrestle all the site productivity and we, we put pine out there to maximize the growth of pine. We take, we're trying to take the hardwoods of life. Okay? And over time, at least amongst a lot of foresters, and in particular foresters in Mississippi State, these mixed upland hardwood stands have been always viewed as kind of poorly managed. They're the uh, red-headed stepchild of the family because we're not maximizing anything out there, all right? And they'll take a look at this, this image here, and I actually meant to have that up here, hopefully that on the malware situation. Um, but the, a forester, a lot of times, will take a look at a stand like that, and they would say, well, we're not maximizing prime productivity out there. So we're, we're, our spacing is not uh, uniform, and, and Obviously, pine is not dominating the stand. Moreover, a lot of our hardwoods are poorly formed. Okay, that's just a legacy of some of the uh, high grade that has gone on throughout the southeast and really everywhere for that matter. But that doesn't mean that you can't grow high quality timber. It doesn't mean that you can't have a productive stand. And it doesn't mean that over time we can't improve timber quality. That's forestry. That's not pine management, but that's what forestry is in lots of parts of the world where we're always continuously managing, trying to improve the quality of our stands, growing higher quality rather than volume out there. Okay? So, in addition to that, I think there's a lot of valuable attributes that a lot of people aren't aware of a mixed species stand that can kind of help tip the balance between 
yes, we're probably not maximizing time productivity anymore, but we're getting a lot back. And I'll go over a few of these. First is risk, okay? Species-specific pests and pathogens. When we put monocultures on the landscape, we automatically increase the risk of that, okay? Monocultures are not a natural state in the majority of the ecosystems out there. You're going to have more species out there. So we are artificially increasing the risk to things like southern pine beetle. All right, take a look at this map. This is from 1960 to 2015, uh, southern pine beetle outbreaks. And obviously the darker the color, the more severe the situation. You see central Alabama, since the 60s up to 2015, has been hit pretty hard with southern pine beetle outbreaks, okay? Southern pine beetles aren't going anywhere, folks. It's a native species, it's part of the ecosystem. There are cyclic outbreaks that happen. Our management has helped contain them by thinning our stands, but guess what's happening? Remember I told you about all those prices in Mississippi for pulp? Lots of folks aren't thinning anymore. And southern pine beetle, what can it do? If it, an outbreak gets rolling, it can kill healthy trees, okay? So southern pine beetle is here to stay, and by managing a mixed species stand, by reducing how much pine you have out there, you are reducing your risk of having a catastrophic event happen at the stand level. Okay, you're still gonna have some volume and hardwoods that's left to manage if indeed a southern pine beetle outbreak were to occur. Another issue, everybody recognize that guy? Yeah, absolutely. So in Michigan, my whole career got started trying to rescue stands from Emerald Ash War because we were managing stands for 60 years through selection silviculture. Some of the most beautiful upland white ash stands you will ever see. The stands are about 60-70% white ash because we've been grooming it that way for years. Clear up to three logs. Beautiful stuff. It's all gone. Just like that, it's all gone. Um, all that work, tending the stands, getting them up to hardwood, high quality, was taken away by this insect. Um, unfortunately, it's now in Alabama. Um, got here, I believe, last year in the northeast part of the state. Um, I think, just in short on Emerald Ash Borer, ash is not as, as heavy of a component of your forest, so that's a good thing. Um, but if you do have a stand, that's heavy in white ash or green ash. It's something to be thinking about. But the point I'm trying to illustrate is we don't know what's coming down the road. It could be an invasive species that comes in and all of a sudden targets oak. Then what? So this is where these maximizing species diversity can help mitigate your risk to things like this in the future. Wildlife habitat. I'm not a wildlife biologist, but I hear them all the time talk about uh, multiple species uh, is going to increase the quality of habitat, in particular if you can have mass producing species in your stand. So by managing, for example, a mixed upland uh, oak pine mixture, you're going to get not only the pine seed input, but also the acorn input. Um, and for lots of folks, that's the primary reason they're managing the forest. It's not for timber. Timber is secondary or even third on um, their objective. It's for wildlife habitat. They enjoy the hunting. Okay. Hunting leases is also another source of income you can capture if you've got these, these mass species on your property, you tend to get a higher hunting lease income if you're interested in going that route. Land value. This is something that a lot of folks don't think about. And I had a banker in Jackson actually tell me he buys his properties for the next person to buy them. And when he wants, whenever you want somebody to buy something, just like buying or selling a house, you're better off having multiple bids on that house. Well, you're better off having multiple bids on that property. By having a multi-species uh, uh, state component, you now open that option up to the hunter, okay? Or the forester who's interested in, in just the timber. So you can have the potential of having multiple bids, or at least a higher bid on your property. And I've had real estate agents also tell me who sell timber that if you have that mature hardwood component, that it certainly helps in getting a higher price for your property. All right, 
Talk a little bit about some of the market flexibility. This is the, really the strongest point, in my opinion, for managing a mixed species standard. So timber, like any other commodity, it's a supply and demand situation. I just told you we have way too much pine saw timber on the market, which is really taking down the price of it, okay? The problem with, with timber markets is you can't predict what's gonna happen. If I could predict what's gonna happen, I wouldn't be here today, okay? The other problem is we can't just snap our fingers and grow a product overnight. We're not growing beans that we can replant the field every year. That's not forcing, we're rather inflexible, okay? The reason I like mixed species stands is it provides you a hedge against some of this unpredictability in timber markets. It's just like investing for retirement. You know, you always get advised, don't put all your money in one stock. This is kind of the same thing. Don't put all your money in one forest product class. By managing multiple species, you have access to multiple markets, which I think can help you. And I'll give you an illustration of this graph here. Again, this is timber prices for Mississippi uh, from 2009 up until the first quarter of 2019. Um, you see, ignore the chip and saw down here, but I'm really talking about pine saw timber, how it's really bottomed out in the mid 20s and kind of stayed there uh, really for almost seven or eight years. On the flip side, it's a great time to be in the hardwood market. Okay? Now this graph, 10 years I've been sitting here giving this presentation to a group like you, that graph might flip again. I don't know. I really we can't predict these things very well. But having the ability for when the, the these lines cross for you to be able to, to maximize on that and sell hardwood. Or if it's the inverse, sell pine. Okay? I think that's a valuable thing because it helps you kind of smooth out some of the risk of timber. All right, here's a concept that uh, is, is going to be more research based, and a lot of you probably this would run contrary to everything you've been taught about forestry. It's the concept of over yielding. Okay? Overyielding is essentially when a species, a tree within a species mixture achieves greater growth than a tree growing in a monoculture. Okay? Now, one of the ways you can do that is through complementarity. If the species are going to complement each other, you can get this growth bump. But we don't see it out of every species. All right, warning, I'm going to put up a scary scientific graph. But I'll simplify it for you. Okay. The study was done, all right, full disclosure, this is not in the southeastern United States, this is a European study, okay? But the concept is what I'm trying to, to, to demonstrate for you. These two top graphs are looking at the growth of a conifer and a hardwood together. This one and this one. And these are looking at the growth of um, two deciduous species together. And the black line is the percent annual increment of volume, so just growth. Fancy way of saying growth over time, okay? And you can see the mixture, which is this black line, over time, if you have a conifer and a deciduous species, was greater in this in this particular mixture and that mixture. But we don't see that same trend if we have two hardwood species together, okay? So it's really that conifer hardwood mixture. What it comes down to is you're utilizing the resources of the site at different so you're actually getting more utilization of your site than what you would if you just had one species out there. That has broad implications for forest management in the southeast where we've maximized the growth of one species type out there. Um, full disclaimer, we don't have the southeastern studies to back this up yet. I'm currently working on that, looking at multiple species mixtures and looking at how that affects productivity over time. All right, here's a case study of economics that we actually have done uh, that did look at one mixture between lot lolly pine and sweet gum, okay? So we chose these species because they're relatively shade intolerant. Uh, they're capable of surviving on a wide variety of sites. They're capable of rapid growth, and they have X current crowns, which is gonna allow you to kind of pack the trees in to get more productivity out there. Um, and they're also abundant in the area. It's not hard to get a lot of olive oil and sweet gum. They're both kind of weeds, more or less. So this, you're capable of getting some natural regeneration which you could do this. 
So what we did, this is a stand in northern Louisiana, and we planted one stand in a monoculture of sweet gum, one stand in a monoculture of pine, and one stand as a mixture of sweet gum and pine. Okay? We planted it at 400 trees per acre, so a low density, on a moderately pretty good site. We had site index 50 of 85 feet for lot volley and 78 feet for sweet gum out there, so a pretty good site. We did chemical site preparation. The stand was thinned at 15. Harvested, we simulated a harvest at 30. Um, and we, we held the prices and costs of management at a region-wide average, all right? And I wanna show you the results of this. This is literally, we, we came out with this last week. So we're still tweaking the model to see where some of these stands will fall out. But basically what, to go over this graph, you have, this is your sweet gum only stand. This is your pine only stand. This is your, you have both, so this is your mixture, and when you thinned it, you didn't have any preference for what you thinned. You took out both pine and hardwood equally. Here, we've got the mixture, but we took out all the pine. Here we have the mixture, but we took out all the sweet gum. Same list down here. Under this scenario, we were able to sell the sweet gum for small soft timber. <coughs> Under this scenario, we sold it for pulpwood, okay? And these are just three economic indicators of um, um, what was best on the site, more or less. And what you'll notice is pine one. The, the pine monoculture still won in every single uh, simulation, but our mixture where we didn't have a preference for thin was second. We're not far. Okay, so are you giving up some productivity? This suggests you will, but you're not far off, all right? Now I'm gonna give you a couple caveats to consider that. So pine still won, but, we're, but the mix stands in second place. But what this model does not account for is insect losses. If southern pine beetle runs through that stand, you're gonna lose less volume. That pine model is not going to win, all right? So you get some risk aversion uh, benefits out of that. Disturbance, resilience. Hardwoods are far better in a windstorm of coming back and not getting blown over because they're deeper rooted and their ability to come back is better from, from crown damage, okay? Other caveat, we simulated a 30 year rotation. At that point, we didn't have large uh, sweet gum saw timber yet. We're close, but not quite yet. If you run that another five or 10 years, you get into some larger soft timber for the sweet gum, you may get even closer to your pine only model, okay? And so in, in summary, you're not far managing this two species mixture as compared to a um, pine monoculture. And I think that would surprise a lot of folks who've been ingrained in uh, kind of the pines and mines mindset of forest management. All right, so that gets me to kind of my extension job, and these are some of the big questions that I get, and they're becoming more and more common, which is why I'm here talking about this with you today. Should I consider a mixed species stand? How do I get a mixed species stand? How long is it gonna take me to get that stand on the landscape? Those are the three most common questions I get when we're talking about changing management paradigms. And kind of what we've developed in this paper that we're working on now with that whole group of folks is these models that we always ask people. This is just based on things that we ask people on variables that we think are important to answer that first question. Should I consider managing a mixed species stand? And the three factors we've identified are biological, social, and economic. But within those, obviously, you have lots of different variables. And the three I'll just point out for bio biology to us if you look at the arrow, that's increasing. So the arrow is going to be increasing. So site quality. As we get higher site quality, we think that it's mixed stand management is less viable because you can grow the heck out of lava on pine on that site. And that's probably, if, if your mindset is growing timber, that's what you ought to be doing. Okay? On that lower quality site, where overyielding is actually shown to be more often, growing species in mixture, that's where it might be more appropriate. Okay? Age of the stand, as our age increases and it moves this way, all right, we think it becomes less viable 
because we want a younger stand that still has that pine component in there. Okay, it's going to be much easier to, to not have to start from scratch and put pine back on the landscape because that's intensive. It takes time and money to do. Okay, and then prescribed burning opportunities. Anywhere where you're not really curtailed and using prescribed fire to maintain your species mixture would be more favorable. So we see biologically where you can burn in a younger stand at a lower site quality is probably your best opportunities for mixed species management. Okay. Moving over to economics, same basic concepts. The further you get from the mill, the worse it is. And that's probably the worse it is for any. That's not unique to, to mixed stands. The more markets you have, the better, and the mill diversity that you have, the better. So you get the maximum potential. You have the highest mill diversity, the most markets, and you're the shortest in the mill. The key here, though, is the mill diversity. Mixed stand management will not help you if you don't have mills that are able to take both the hardwood and the pine. Okay, so these are some of the conditions that need to be in place for this to be successful. And social, okay? As a landowner, how interested are you in timber production, okay? We're still, because we don't have all the evidence yet of that over-yielding in southeastern types, until that shows, Lot Lolly's king. I'm not gonna dispute that, okay? So the more interested you are in production, go with Lot Lolly. There's no reason not to. Parcel size, the larger it is, the better and your ownership objectives. The more objectives you have, you're not just interested in one, you want to do multiple things with your property, the better mixed stand management could be because of all the potentials it opens up for you. All right? So that's a very, very uh, oversimplification of all the process. But that, these are just based on the things that we hear from folks all the time. All right, so second part, getting into the silviculture. How do I get a mixed stand and how long is it going to take me to get there? I mean, looking at that, you've got an uneven age stand and it's a pretty complex species mixture. That's not, you're not going to snap your fingers and get that overnight. You know, that's going to take years of forest succession to do, but I don't think we have to take that long to do it. And I think there's multiple ways we can kind of speed up the process and not have to grow pine first and hardwood underneath. I think we can grow them at the same time. And that's really what my research is, is working on that. So I'll give you some ideas on how if we're starting a stand over and you're interested in getting a mixed stand, how I think you can accelerate the process of growing pines and hardwoods together. All right, the first one, this is gonna be the most common one you see all the time, where most of the mixed stands originated, is to cut and walk away, right? We're not planting, we're not doing any site prep. So the advantage of this, you don't have any establishment costs. Uh, you do have an advantage, and I can hear this from a lot of folks, but we have improved the genetics on the landscape for decades. So that seeding that's going to come in from the edges, chances are that's going to come from an improved seed source. From you know the seed, the trees we have on the landscape today are not the same quality that were out there in 1950. We've come a long way in improving that. So you, as a landowner practicing natural regeneration, you get you get the benefit of that. Okay, you have some genetic improvements on landscape already. All right, so disadvantages. We don't control the species. We don't control the spacing. All right, we're gonna lose some genetics. Even though we have improved genetics, we're not putting the top of the line genetics out there that is available, okay? And we're going to lose some productivity as a result of that spacing issue. So those are some disadvantages. Right? But I think, even though this is, is probably not an advisable practice to do if you're going after a mixed stand, sometimes you can get away with it. And if you do get away with it, you've got to be able to recognize that opportunity when it's there. And it's going to look ugly. You're going to walk out there and say, this is a mess. But really recognizing, hey, my stand's on a good trajectory. I've got the species I want, and they're in competitive positions that I want. I need to let it alone. That's one of the hardest things to, to, to convince a landowner. You gotta walk away. Just let it do its thing, because your, your species are already where you want them to be. And for that, okay, you gotta be able to evaluate crown position. So it's really 
having somebody walk out into that clear cut and recognize where are my pines and where are my oaks, if indeed that's what you're trying to do. Okay. So ideally what you want to have is your pines in dominant positions, just ahead, so they have their head up, getting as much light as they can, but you want your hardwoods, or the, the, the desirable hardwoods, just behind them. So if you look at it, think about it in your classic model, your pines would be the dominant crown positions. You want your hardwoods right here as your competitive crown position. So it's just slightly behind, so your pines are training your hardwoods up, and your hardwoods are training your pines. And they're both pushing upwards, trying to keep that X current crown position. That's really what we're looking for. Um, so that's the ideal situation. If you have desirable species in co-dominant positions and pines in the dominant position, let it alone. You stand on a trajectory you want it to be. All right. Intermediate position, if you have hardwoods, like right here, those are the ones you would go in and release if you were going to do an early stand release because they have the most to gain. A suppressed hardwood like that, don't bother with it. The crown's going to be too small. It's already too far behind. It's probably not going to respond enough to give you enough bang for your buck. All right, if you were to go about and want to do this to where you've got to release some stems to get a more desirable species mixture, you can do, we have the tools, all right? Herbicide injection, if you're going to go with hardwoods, 20% of mazavir would be your go-to to, to um, take hardwoods off of the landscape. And for pines, using a glyphosate 41% solution. What you're going for in releasing these saplings are seven to 10 feet for oaks. You need to clear out around them. Sweet gum needs only about five. And pine, I always say about 10 feet, okay? To give them enough room to breathe to, to gain a better competitive advantage. All right, let's talk about a more active approach. Okay, this isn't gonna be your clear cut and walk away. This is gonna be you're gonna actively go plant some species because you don't like the species mixture you have, okay? This is a block approach, all right? So what you would do is divide your stand in half. And say, I'm gonna manage hardwoods on one half, and I'm managing pine on the other. So what you wanna do is do your chemical side prep and plant one side in pine. You might want to plant at the highest genetics and just try to maximize your productivity. Run that, that pine 2.0 I talked about at the beginning. On the other half, use natural regeneration for hardwoods. Okay? So you're kind of a hybrid stand of planting and natural regeneration. The advantages. This is an even age approach, silk culture. I'm not doing an uneven age. This is an even age stand. So it's operationally simple to implement. But functionally, what you're going to get is a two-age stand because your pines are going to outgrow your hardwoods, and so you're going to get two, two stands really out of this, okay? And over an 80-year rotation, you're going to have two pine rotations and one hardwood. This is essentially what you're going to get, all right? So the, the benefits, the true mixed stand, would come in the second or third rotation that you have when your hardwoods get mature. At that point, you would have a true mixed stand. The reality is you have two even age stands, one pine, one hardwood. So the advantages, lower establishment costs. You're cutting your establishment costs in half because you're only site prepping half of your property and you're only planting half of your property, okay? You are retaining some pine productivity. We're not turning our backs on pine. I'm not advocating that at all. I think that there will be a time for pine and it will come back and you will have that ability because it will still be in your pine. You'll still be in your stand. And it's not as complex as a true mixed stand species. You're not growing them together, okay? The disadvantages, we are giving up some pine productivity, okay? Half our stand, we're not maximizing growth. Um, we're not getting that balanced timber portfolio until we get to that latter stage of development when our hardwoods are mature. Okay, so we're not going to have a true mixed stand until later. Um, and I think it's going to require a relatively large tract of land to pull this off. Because at least in Mississippi, like I said, you need at least 40 acres to get a logger on it. Well, think about that first rotation. Your hardwoods are not going to be ready yet. 
So you need to have enough land and pine to get somebody interested to do the work on that side of it. So I think you need at least 80 acres right now to pull this off. All right, here's another option. This one I, I, I don't advocate at all, and there's some reasons for that. I think this is only an option for a truly large landowner, and it's to, to have two planted plantations on your property. So same setup where you split the property in half. You're just planting hardwoods and you're planting pines in this situation, okay? So you don't have any logistical complexity. They are gonna be growing essentially as an even age stand again. The problem with this that I see is, what do, how much do we truly know about upland hardwood plantations? Not much that I know of, anyways. Uh, I think we, we've done a lot of work in some of the CRP and WRP for the bottom ones, and there's minimal knowledge that's come out of that, but in terms of managing upland hardwood plantations, we are way behind in knowledge in terms of our pine management. So I don't think that the science is advanced enough to really be confident to, to advocate managing uh, hardwood plantation in the uplands right now. So I, I do not advocate this method, but I thought I would bring it up. All right, intermixing your artificial and natural. This is where we're truly getting into a mixed species stand. Um, in this scenario, we plant our pines quite wide. I advocate 15 feet or wider, personally, okay? We band herbicides. We're not doing the full site prep broadcast spray. We're doing a banding spray within three feet of the pine rows. So we're using less chemical out there, but perhaps more labor to do it. Um, and we're allowing the hardwoods to regenerate in between our rows. Okay, so now we're truly integrating both species types into our one stand. The advantages, again, we're retaining some pine productivity. We have a true species mixture on our site. And we have flexibility achieved within that stand, okay? Because you can take it either way. You can, you can go with your row thinnings. If you anticipate pines coming back, you can take out the hardwoods and just grow pine or the vice versa and just grow hardwoods, okay? So you get that flexibility. Disadvantages, again, we're losing some pine productive, productivity. It is certainly more complex to manage them as complete blocks separately. Um, and it's very dependent on getting your hardwood regeneration, okay? Between those rows, getting that uh, solid density of hardwoods to get that stem quality up there. Okay. Here's the result of a study that was actually done in Tennessee. Okay, this is kind of getting at what I was talking about of intermixing the pines and the hardwoods together. This is a study where they planted loblolly pine and oak on a, two spaces, six by six, where they just planted oaks. And this is primarily a hardwood study, which is why it's oak-centric. But they just planted oaks at a six by six spacing, and this is northern red oak they planted. And then they did the other half where they intercropped, they mixed loblolly and um, northern red oak. Amongst that, they had three different planting quality, planting stocks. You had high quality red oak, which is a 2.0, uh, just that they were grown for longer, so they're gonna be a larger planting stock, a larger seedling. You had a high quality call, which is a larger seedling, but a lower quality amongst that group. And you had your standard, where you did no genetic improvement, small seedling. Okay, the loblolly pine was an unimproved loblolly pine. They just stuck what they could get out there because, again, this is mostly a hardwood study that they were doing. And what you'll see, this is survival, or this is mortality. Okay, so we don't want to be up here; we want to be down here. Our interplanted high-quality oaks had the highest survival, where we really saw. Uh, a lot of mortality is if we ended up getting the lower genetic stuff. So the take home message was genetics was the strongest uh, factor in survival. It wasn't the intermixing at all. Okay, genetics was the strongest factor. But if we come to growth, this is just growth, height growth here over 14 years, our interplanted oaks of a high seedling quality type did just as well as the control oaks of the high, uh, the control of oaks planted together. So what that tells you is planting them together, you didn't give up your productivity, at least in the oaks. 
they're growing just as well. And we didn't look at the pine itself, but just from our observations, the pine is actually finally overtopped the oaks, but we haven't given up productivity either. And that's on a six by six spacing. So some of that overyielding, we're starting to get us some, some data looking at this and whether they can be used together to grow. Um, but at least this is encouraging if you're interested in managing a mixed species stand that we didn't give up productivity in the intermixing if we use the higher quality stock. All right, the last scenario I'll talk about, and this is a good one for converting pine plantations, which is uh, why I included it, because I think a lot of folks are at the end of a pine plantation and they're, they're frustrated with the outlook and looking potentially to do something different. This is a seed tree and burn, okay? So what you want to do is leave six to 10 of your best quality Loblolly pines out there at the end of your rotation um, for your pine plantation and leave those as seed sources. Okay, that's your genetic source going forward. And what you're going to try to do is get natural regeneration if you like the, the crop beneath your pine plantation or underplant beneath this. Okay, so what this is going to require after the harvest, the seed tree harvest, is going to be a burn. Or if you don't like your species composition, a herbicide mix in an underplant. Okay, so what you're achieving, what you're going after here, is getting natural regeneration from your pines and getting hardwood sprouts to come up, or getting planted seedlings of the species you desire to come up. And then you can leave those large pines as reserves, or take them off if you'd like later. That's another way in which you can kind of quickly truncate getting a. a higher species diversity out there in the landscape. So the advantages, minimal site uh, costs, especially if you can do some of the natural regeneration and use those hardwood sprouts to your advantage. Uh, you're going to get a greater control of species uh, uh, composition than if you just clear cut and walked away because you are maintaining some of your best pines on that site. Okay. Disadvantages, of course, you're going to have some spacing issues, which is going to cost you some productivity down the line. Uh, and your hardwood sprouts may still outcompete your pines, so you may run into a situation uh, where it becomes more hardwood dominant than you want to. But I'll be, I mean, I, in my introduction, you heard I'm a longleaf guy. Boy, would this be a good thing to do with longleaf. Because you can just burn over the pine and the hardwoods at the same time until you've got the species mixture that you wanted. Won't work quite as good with lava because you're going to kill your lava lava seedlings, but with lava long leaf, I really like this method. So, with that, I'll just bring a couple summary points. If you remember nothing at all from what I said today, just remember these. Uh, in my mind, forestry in the South has always been tied to markets. I started off with the pulp market, right? Driving reforestation on the landscape. There was a need, we moved our management towards it. Well, in some parts of the South, that model is coming under stress. We need to move in another direction to maintain forestry's profitability for the landowners. Okay? Mixed dam management, I think, could be a viable option. Not for everyone, but for some, especially with some of the factors that I highlighted in my talk, it might work for you. But I think if you're gonna go down this road, you need to clearly know your objectives, because not all species mixtures are the same. Don't think you're going to get a highly productive mix if you put hickory out there. Hickory in an oak, you're not going to be as productive. Okay, you need to really think about going after wildlife or going after productivity. Get the right species mixture out there to make it work. But also, don't force it. Use it if it works for you. If it doesn't, that's fine. There's lots of other social cultural options out there. 